I don't know this one. Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, yada 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 yada. Okay, I'm still doing all the requests I sold off. I think I'm about halfway through. This is taking forever. And once again, we are going back to the mid to late 90s. And normally this is where I'd complain about how I wished we'd had more variants in the requests, but actually, yeah, this one's a little out there for me. This is Canadian singer slash songwriter slash pianist slash harpist slash accordionist Lorena McKennett. And, uh, yeah, I am well afield of my usual genres today. <laughs> this is an alt rocker new wave. This is way out of my expertise. Uh, I don't remember this, and it seems like a lot of people don't either. And personally, I don't know very much about new age Celtic world music. And no, I'm not saying that Celtic music is the same thing as world music or New Age music. So save the pedantic comments. I'm saying that Miss McKennett has been variously described as an artist in all three of those genres. I know they're not the same thing, but they do have a lot of overlap. And the big thing they have in common is that they do not have hits. Or at least they do very rarely. And Lorena McKennett was one of the few who did when she reached the top 20 in the winter of 1998 with her single, The Mummer's Dance. Yeah, y'all remember the Mummer's Dance. <laughs> remember when the Mummer's Dance was everywhere? That's so 90s, right? No, it was. Look at this. Right between NSYNC and Third Eye Blind, the Mummer's Dance. That was an actual thing that happened. The hell kind of pagan wicker man shit is going on here? What the hell is a Mummer? What's a Mummer's Dance? No, I clearly said Mummer's Dance. That's not the same thing. Well, we'll get to it. What a mummer's dance is, is less interesting to me than the fact that this was a mainstream hit at all. Like, this is all very strange to me. I am flying blind. I can tell you this, she has long red hair and she plays the harp, which is exactly how I pictured her as. And she also has millions of fans. She has sold 15 million records. I was completely unaware of her, but if you're a New Age listener, she is absolutely huge, especially in her home country. And the fans of her I talked to confirmed, if I treat her with any less than the respect she deserves, they'll string me up with mandolin strings and beat me like a piñata. So, if you are into new age music, you probably already know her name and all her work, and she's a superstar to you. But for our purposes today, she is a one-hit wonder. Let us begin. And dance our merry dance! Hey, nanny nanny ho! Okay, so... One more time, full warning, I'm in new ground, this is not my genre. I have friends who love this shit, I've seen a couple shows with them, shows with kilted men and women in long green skirts playing those little hand drums that you hit with what looks like a chicken bone, and it's just not my thing. So to properly research this, I had to resort to something I rarely do, which is talk to other people. Ugh. And it turns out some of the people I know have a lot of thoughts about Lorena McKinnon. So here's what I've gleaned. Lorena McKinnon is from Stratford, Ontario, and she says she didn't even want to pursue music, she just fell into it. She wanted to be a vet, but she got into Irish folk in college. And she got her start by busking on the streets of Toronto and getting her listeners' addresses and mailing them her demo tapes. And she built up a serious following that way, so among other things, she is a marketing genius. Now, she released some independent albums in the 80s, but here she is in 1991 on her big major label debut. This is called The Lady of Shalott based, of course, on the Alfred Lord Tennyson poem. Round an island there below, the island of Shalott. Not the first reference I've seen to that poem doing these music reviews. If I die young. But there was a half-assed attempt to seem poetic. Lorena treats Tennyson with a little more dignity because it's literally just the actual poem set to music. In fact, a lot of her work is classical poetry set to music. It's very pretty if you like romantic Victorian poetry. Me personally, I did not major in English, so I feel a little under-equipped. You know, some people really like all this poncy medieval stuff, but for me the layers of tradition feel more distancing than bringing the past to life. Am I not giving this my all? I'm gonna try harder. Okay, let's take a look at one of her bigger singles, The Bonnie Swans. Ooh, The Bonnie Swans. Sorry, being serious. Hey ho, bunny-o. 
Uh, okay, uh, it says here that Bonnie Swans is based off the Trois Sisters, which is an old English murder ballad about a girl who drowns her sister out of jealousy. Yeah, push the youngest in. Huh. Okay, so it turns out The Bonnie Swans is an incredibly macabre and sarcastic title. Because in the third verse, a little girl's looking down the river and is like, Look, Dad, a swan's floating by. <laughs> no, it's a corpse. He made a of lost <laughs> what the fuck? Okay, I totally forgot that medieval literature is dark and gross as hell. That's fucking metal. I totally get the appeal of this one, at least. And that came out around 94, which is right around the time that Celtic music started hitting its peak popularity in America. Now see, here's a thing that was kinda surprising for me to realize. Celtic music has not always been a thing. In fact, it was invented in 1992 for the soundtrack to Ron Howard's Far and Away. The Celts have no known musical traditions before that year. I'm kidding, but it is actually newer than you think. Like, yes, the Celts have always had music, but the distinct commercial genre that you can buy CDs of at Barnes & Noble, that's relatively recent. Like, you think pipes and jigs and stuff, because a band called The Chieftains nailed all that down in the 60s. And it only started getting really mainstream around the 80s in the UK, and it doesn't really pop in America until the mid-90s, what with the river dance and the Braveheart and all that. And the quick growth of that scene proved really helpful for McKenna. She even started seeing some of her songs show up in movies. Uh, no, not Braveheart. Uh, nope. Getting warmer. Highlander 3, The Sorcerer. There you go. Yes, she soundtracked both the Highlander TV show and the third movie. The genre was still breaking into the mainstream. You gotta start somewhere. You know, while we're talking about Celtic New Age, I should really do the comparison between McKennett and the big Celtic New Age superstar, Anya. I saw a lot of sites called McKennett the Canadian Enya, but I talked to my friends and they assured me that Enya's, you know, she's alright. She may be more famous, but she doesn't have the wide genre range like McKennett has. I mean, Enya's had some good records, but it's been mostly downhill since Shepherd Moons, right? After that, she's had a few decent songs here and there, but she's never reached those heights again. I have no idea what I'm talking about. But the whole wider range of genre thing, yes, I totally get that, because in addition to Celtic music, a lot of McKennett's stuff is inspired by the music of Galicia. Yeah, that's a real place. It's that little nub of Spain that sticks out over Portugal. And apparently McKennett just absolutely loves Spain. And especially Galicia, which, believe it or not, is also Celtic. Yeah, a millennium and a half ago, the Celts settled that area too, and Celtic culture is extremely alive over there. You don't see any, like, flamenco or castanets. They play the bagpipes. <laughs> And because Spain was then conquered by the Moors, there's a lot of Arabic influence in McKennett's work too. According to her, she just likes traveling to places and then listening to their music and working it into her own work. She calls it a travelogue. So basically she makes records the same way people make Facebook vacation albums. And I guess you could say she has some New Age influence, but I don't know if you can really call it that because New Age is basically not even a real thing. It's a wide collection of music that doesn't really have anything in common, except that it sounds like a brain massage. Ah, uh, yeah, that's the stuff. Something soothing and relaxing. And this one even has some Gregorian chanting in it. Monk chanting was also popular in the 90s. It was a whole thing. I swear I'm not kidding. Man, this episode is bringing up memories of a lot of weird shit I forgot about. But anyway, while she certainly worked hard to make her art, I don't think she was prepared to have a hit. Here's the hit. So in 1997, Lorena McKinnett releases her big hit, The Mummer's Dance. Which means we need to get back to the original question. What the hell is a mummer? I was just kidding earlier, I do know what a mummer is, but only because it comes up in the Song of Ice and Fire books a lot. Around every other chapter, Tyranny is like, Is this a jape? Some kind of mummer's farce? Yeah, they wrote that out of the show. Probably for the best. Anyway, a mummer is like a medieval mime. You know, they dance or pretend to sword fight. Those are mummers. You might have known this word already if you're older and you remember the 70s mime group Mummenschance. Or if you live in Philly, because they have the Mummers Parade every year. 
This year, the parade was a bunch of drunk guys flipping cars and shouting Big Dick Nick over and over. So there you have it. In the 90s, the decade of irony, we had a completely sincere song about everyone's favorite thing, dancing minds. So this is basically the safety dance of the 90s. And this is important to know here, this is a remix. The original version sounded more like this. And then it got pumped up a bit by the English electronica duo DNA. Now they're best known for taking a folk singer's a cappella single. To the woman who has come in, she is shaking her umbrella. And I look the other way. And then adding a dance beat. <laughs> So yeah, that's kind of their thing. And they did it again for Lorena. The difference is a lot subtler this time, but you can still definitely hear it. There's more echo effects and a bit of a bass thump on the end of each measure. I mean, they could have gone for it even more if they'd wanted. And it makes sense, because this is already a dance song. It has dance right in the title. If you read the lyrics, it's apparently festival time, and the mummers are going door to door like Christmas carolers. Because it's a holiday. Spring is in the air. We're going to frolic around the maypole and sacrifice goats. I don't know what they did back then. The point is, it's a happy song. If Party Rock Anthem was written in the 13th century, it'd sound like this. So how did it get big? A throwback to medieval times, and probably the last song ever written where gay still means happy. We bring a gun it's out of place. How do we get something driven by an accordion, and a fiddle, and a hurdy-gurdy, and one of those Arabic string instruments I don't know the name of? Well, the dance elements are one part of it. The big Celtic revival was a much bigger part of it. But there's one factor even bigger than that that I think deserves mention. River Dance and Braveheart certainly primed the pump, but the Mummers Dance first charts of the week of December 20th, 1997, and peaked in March of 1998. You know what pop culture event was happening during pretty much that exact length of time? Titanic. Biggest movie of all time at the time. Release that same exact week in December. I don't believe that's a coincidence, especially what with that soundtrack being absolutely huge, not only because of Celine Dion's giant theme song, but also there's Irish jigs all over the place in that movie. It was Celtic folk's biggest mainstream exposure of all time. So if you wanted a singer that had Celine's beautiful vocals, but with the authenticity of Leo's Irish friends playing their folk music, well, here you go. And in fact, you can see Lorena and Celine go neck and neck on the adult top 40 charts all that winter. And not only did it chart on the easy listening stations, it also showed up on the modern rock charts? I don't know how that happened, but I gotta believe that means the Lilith Fair crowd got into this too. I certainly hear it at least. She does not sound all that different from Tori Amos. You take out the rock and roll, you replace the angry and personal lyrics with madrigals, and there you go. And I have to admit, I'm really starting to feel it too. All of McKinnon's other stuff feels a little remote to me. Stuff you listen to in the background or you put on to feel smart rather than enjoy. Eh, maybe that's not fair. Like I said, it's not my genre. But that little bounce in the remix makes this one single feel a lot more direct. It's old English ballads turned sexy and fun. I mean, the groove on this song just kills. It feels like it works on all levels. As a medieval throwback that you can play at the Ren Fair, as an alternative track for artsy girls, and as a thumping club track. Well, maybe that last one's overstating it. But I feel it, and the world felt it too. Please welcome Lorena McKinnon. Mummer's Dance brought her to the absolute pinnacle of success in New Age music, which is that she showed up on one of those pure mood CDs. Ah, the memories. And Mummer's Dance even showed up as the theme song for a show on UPN that year. It was a cowboy show about ranchers in Kentucky, and the theme song was wildly off-genre. This is why UPN doesn't exist anymore. But my point is, she was nationwide. And, uh, that was about it as far as Lorena McKennett and pop culture goes. But let's see where she went from there. Yeah, this is one of those times where...
failed is so obviously incorrect that I'm not even going to dignify it. She's a new age artist. She's not supposed to have even one hit to begin with. That's like saying Colonel Sanders was a failed restaurateur because he only had the one fast food chain. In this case, one's all you need. For the record, if you actually do want to know what she released after this, it's something called Marco Polo. Yeah, it's very, uh, Arabic. And yeah, the perfect storm of trends that brought us the Mummer's Dance was not going to do the same for Marco Polo. There was and is no Arabic music trend in America. All that stuff gets labeled world music, which is where they pile up the music of every other non-European culture. Maybe one day one of those musics will trend big enough to get its own section in the CD store, but it was not happening at the time. This song doesn't even have lyrics, so the crossover appeal was very low. Most importantly, there was no remix. It wouldn't have been particularly amenable to a remix anyway. I mean, this is not something you can turn into a dancey song. Or can you? Damn, son, where'd you find this? But that's not what derailed Lorena McKinnett's career. What did derail it was a horrible personal tragedy. Her fiancé died in a boating accident. By all accounts, she took it very hard because she disappeared from the music world for nearly a decade. She did start a charity for a sea and air rescue that she is still very serious about, and she released a one-off song here and there, but for the most part, right at her peak, she went on indefinite hiatus. Well, fortunately for her fans, yes, she did in fact return to recording. In fact, I was repeatedly recommended her live album from 2006 at the Alhambra in Spain. So if this seems like your thing, check that out. It's a 3-disc CD DVD set though, so if that seems like a little bit of a time commitment, you can instead check out Disney's direct-to-video Tinkerbell, which she narrated and did the theme song for. Discover the story of the world's most beloved fairy. And yeah, she has in fact kept making records since then. This one is called Penelope's Dream. It's about Odysseus' wife in The Odyssey. So if you're a classics nerd or you have fond memories of your high school lit classes, I'd take a listen. And if you're interested, she did release a new album a couple months ago and she's going on tour next year. Should we even answer this? She sold 15 million records. That's the same amount of records that the Bare Naked Ladies sold and they just got inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. But what I mean by did she deserve better is does she deserve better than being called a one-hit wonder? And yes, obviously she deserves better than that. But I don't think anyone really thinks of her in those terms. I don't think people even remember her one hit. But those that do, it seems to have gotten them devoted to her for life. This was a weird episode, but I appreciate being able to do it. There are a lot of genres that won't ever get out of their niche unless the stars line up just right. And that's what happened here. When she started showing up on the rock charts, she said that people have broader tastes than they're given credit for. And I guess she was right. Lorena is still one of the most popular acts of New Age around, and she'll probably perform for the rest of her life. I salute her. Everybody mummer dance! Hey, 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 hey